Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, ah, okay. Hear. Sorry, I forgot. I always forget the microphone. Yes. Welcome, sir. So is the morning there or is the afternoon? It is almost 12 noon. Well, Just a few more minutes. Ah, hello, Pramod uh, Kumasi. Hello. Nice to see you both. So, please allow me, I close the window here. It's very loud outside. Yeah, let's come on.
Send this chat, sir? Yes, one minute. I'm just going to add my email address. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it's time. Yeah, it's 3.30 now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I have to open everything up again. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, can you see it again? No, right now, no. It tells me it's presenting. Yes, now it's can Ah, good, good, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Prasad Joshi, Honorable Professor John Peterson, today's guest of honor, my colleagues and students. On behalf of the Kid College Guest Lecture and Webinar Subcommittee, I, Shalendra Mohan, welcome you all to this bicentenary lecture series at our university. As we know, the Kid College Postgraduate and Research Institute is the third oldest educational institution in our country and is celebrating its bicentenary this year. To mark this occasion, the university has initiated bicentenary lecture series in the field of archaeology, linguistics, and Sanskrit studies. Today's guest of honor, Professor John Peterson, will deliver the bicentenary lecture. I request our vice chancellor, Professor Prasad Joshi, to welcome Professor John Peterson. Namaskar. Good afternoon to everyone. I take this opportunity to extend our warm welcome to Professor John Peterson, who is present here to deliver his lecture on the topic, What Can Modern Languages of India Tell Us About Her Past? I think this topic is very important. India is a multilingual country, and four major language families are being spoken throughout India. And India, or we may say, this subcontinent, India, sub, Indian subcontinent, South Asia, has attracted the attention of linguists of the world because of its peculiarity of these languages. And Professor John Peterson, eminent linguist, is the authority for the study of South Asian languages. And today we are actually highly privileged and benefited, going to be benefited by his lecture on this particular topic. So on behalf of Deccan College and also my own personal behalf, I extend warm welcome to Professor John Peterson. Sir, please accept our welcome. Thank you for sparing your time with us and no sooner we invited you, you readily accepted our invitation and this shows your affection towards this institute, which is celebrating the bicentennial year. Friends, Second College have pioneered linguistics, study of modern linguistics in India. This 
is that is well known to all of you and it has been in the United Nations at this moment. Taking the opportunity of bicentenary, what we decided, we wanted to listen to eminent scholars from all the three disciplines that Deccan College is dealing with, namely Sanskritis, Linguistics and Archaeology. And every month we have one lecture to be added to this uh, series. And this is the sixth lecture. So I thank Professor Shailendra Mohan and his committee members for continuously taking efforts to invite seminar scholars and enrich our knowledge on these three particular disciplines. So the committee also deserves profuse thanks for organizing this very important series. So once again, I welcome the guest of honor today and also all the participants for joining this lecture from various corners of the world. I can see them uh, in the participants list. So with these few words, again, welcoming uh, and thanking the guest of honor, I would like to stop here. Thank you. It is over to Shailendra Mohan now. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Subhanji Kardile to introduce our guest of honor, Professor John Peterson. Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to introduce Professor John Peterson to all of you. Professor John Peterson is Professor and Chair of Linguistics at University of Kiel, Germany. He has worked extensively on South Asian languages, especially Kharia, Santali, Mandari, Sadri, Kopi, Nepali, Pali and Sanskrit. His research interests are historical linguistics, descriptive linguistics, language typology, sociolinguistics, and linguistic theory. His research projects include towards a linguistic prehistory of Eastern Central South Asia and beyond, and literacy acquisition in schools in the context of migration and multilingualism, a comparative study. He has published extensively on South Asian languages from different linguistic perspectives. Some of his publications are fitting the pieces together towards a linguistic prehistory of Eastern Central South Asia and beyond, Jharkhand as a linguistic area, language contact between Indo-Aryan and Munda in Eastern Central South Asia, the Munda Dictionary Project, a Sadri English English Sadri lexicon, a Kharia English English Kharia lexicon, the Nepali Converse, a holistic approach, Grammatical Relations in Pali and the Emergence of Archativity in Indo-Aryan. His descriptive work on Kharia is considered to be the best description of a Munda language in India. He is the general editor of the Brill's Studies in South and Southwest Asian Languages. He is also a member of Editorial Board of Journal of South Asian Languages and Linguistics. He was also Regional Editor Europe for the Annual Review of South Asian Languages and Linguistics. Professor Peterson is one of the 25 PIs in the seven-year cluster of excellence roots, connectivity of society, environment, and culture in past world, funded by the German Research Council. It is a privilege to have you, Professor Peterson, for the Deccan College Bicentenary Guest Lectures and Webinars. I now request you to give, you, give the talk on what can the modern languages of India tell us about her past, the contribution of sociolinguistic typology to Indian history. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the kind words, Ms. Kabile, and thank you also, Vice Chancellor Joshi, for your very kind invitation to this um, to this wonderful uh, celebration of a bicentenary of uh, your your college. Um, it is well known to linguists around the world, and certainly to anyone working on South Asian languages. I still have my book here. I worked on Korea, that's true, and it all began with this work by Professor Billy Giri, published at the Centenary Jubilee um, at your university, and I am delighted to have received the invitation, and um, I did not hesitate for one second. I, was, I accepted it uh, immediately, and I would like to thank you, and also uh, Professors uh, Sonara Kulkani and Shalene de Mohan, at, your, at the linguistics department at your university, um, with whom I am in close cooperation, and um, whose work is also, I'm sure they will recognize parts of it in my in my discussion. Now, may I ask you, can you see my presentation? Is, is it visible for everyone? Yes, sir. 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 Yes,
Sir, but the viewers are not able to view, uh, view it in the full screen mode. Yes. Is it full screen now? Uh, please. Uh, no, sir. Turn on the slideshow mode. I think. Then. Excuse me, John. You go to the slide mode and you will. Slideshow. There is no more mode here. I, I don't have slide mode here. 
yes you do you uh, you go to the slide mode top left we have lost your presentation now so i can't guide you uh it should be back yeah it is coming back yes, it's coming back <coughs> is it full screen this time no it's not it's it's on editing mode okay i'm afraid i don't see any of what you're talking about here um okay i'll tell you so it's not a the red bottom on the I'm red sorry, bottom on the red bottom i cannot understand you Hi, John. Just press F5. Just press F5 on your screen. Please press F5. Yes, that. Hello. Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. uh, sir. Yes. Ah, uh, uh, when you click on the present now button, uh, please select the, your entire screen option. When you click the present now. Ah, uh, in the Google Meet, uh, when you uh, click on present now, please select the and en your entire screen option. Your entire screen option. I'm sorry. Are, are you speaking to me or to each other? To you, you, John, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I really can't understand anyone here except for Shalendra. Okay. You have to select sir, your entire screen. Yes, I did. I did okay. both times. So I'm, I'm hitting now entire screen. <coughs> Nothing is visible. Is anything visible now? It's coming. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Please tell me, is that full screen now? Yes. Yes, it's a full screen now. Ah, I have no idea what just happened. I just hit the same buttons I've been hitting the whole time. Is it really full screen? Ah, okay. We can celebrate yes, now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm very sorry for that. So I'll start again. Um, I, uh, we've already discussed the, the languages here. I hope you can see my cursor move, the arrow move. Um, in the south, of course, the Dravidian languages, most of them. But you see also in the middle of the subcontinent, these blue patches. These are, of course, smaller Dravidian languages. Then we have purple languages here. These are the Munda languages. Um, these are mostly North Munda languages. Here, of course, Korku, from my perspective, very close to all of you. And um, perhaps not from your perspective, but from where I'm sitting, that is just a few hundred kilometers. So very close. And then we have the South Munda languages down here and one here. Now, we also have a few others that I will not talk about today. We have the Tibeto Burman languages. And here we have Kasi Wat, and of course I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the mainland, so we'll just be discussing these languages today. Now, um, Indo-Aryan has of course a very long tradition, going back at least 3,000 years, perhaps longer, um, and you would think that it would now be so well understood that we could easily classify what languages belong to what group, but there is no real consensus here. This is one consensus that goes back to Rearson, actually uh, Hamza, prior to him. It has some proponents, but it is generally not, not accepted nowadays. Uh, it's going for somewhat of a comeback, though. We have the inner languages and the outer languages and then intermediate languages, although <clears throat> excuse me, it does produce some quite interesting results such as putting Konkani and Marathi together with uh, Bangla, Bangla and Sindhi in one group. 
There are similarities between these languages which need to be explained, but most, I think most linguists would now say that's not really a group. So <clears throat> all that, that basically is to describe the languages where they're spoken. So you have a northwestern group, the central group, a Magadan group, an eastern group, and then the southern group, uh, Konkani and Marathi, Marathi. So um, to continue first the, the, the overview, these are the Munda languages. Korea, the language I've been working on now, where I worked on for about 10 years before I published my work, is spoken in Chhattisgarh, Orissa, and in Chalkant. Then you have many, many smaller languages here. But you also have in the south, the Orissa um, Andhra Pradesh border, you have quite a few languages. These are South Munda. So Korea, Juan, and these languages here are all South Munda. And they are not at all in in intelligible with the North Munda languages. They are perhaps as close uh, as, as English would be with uh, Austrian German. If you know what a word means, you might be able to recognize what it where it comes from, but you would never understand the whole sentence. So they're quite actually quite different. But also, Korku here in Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, is also a North Munda language together with these, but there is quite a large break between the two, and it goes back at least, at least 2,000 years, if not more, they belong to North Munda, but you have a Korku branch, and then it's called a Karwari, Kar, uh, Karwarian branch, I'll just pronounce it in English. And <clears throat> these languages here are often as close to one another as dialects are, but Korku is very different, so we have a very uh, abrupt break between the two of them. And I'll come back to that in one minute. Now this is what the Munda, the, the what the family looks like now. It is also part of a larger unit, the phylum referred to as Austroasiatic, with its focus in the east, in Southeast Asia. Vietnamese, uh, Khmer, uh, also referred to uh, sometimes as Cambodian, and then smaller groups, Palangic, Khmuic, Molnik, Asmian, etc. So it's always been a question of where do the mother languages come from? Are they remnants? of a group that moved eastwards, or is it from the eastern part, where we find most languages nowadays, of people who moved towards the west. And in recent years, I'm not a specialist on this, but in recent years, the, um, the, the main idea has been that these represent languages of speakers who moved from Southeast Asia towards India, landing probably at the Mahanadi in Odisha, and moving, spreading out from there. And that is what I would like to come to now. This uh, has been put forward by Felix Kahl and Paul Sidwell just, one, just two years ago. They look at the distribution of Munda languages today in India. And these are districts with considerable Munda populations. And you can see it's very, often, it's very clearly clustered in the eastern part of the subcontinent with Kwarku. In, um, in, in central India. Now the authors say, well, if they landed about here, this I guess is the, the approximate region of the Mahanadi Delta, and then they spread out. Now they say that these were rice growing and millet growing people, and that they spread out into this region. But of course, this region, as you all know, is not an easy region to do agriculture in. You can, of course, plant rice. I mean, it's done everywhere. But especially if you're the first people to, to till the soil, you will spend most of your time digging rocks out of the soil. This, these are rugged hills, and fields do exist, but they have to first be cleared, and then the rocks have to be taken out. This is not. This would not be their first choice. Would be my guess. Now. Rao and Sidwell say, well, they stopped and did not go into the Ganges Basin. They stopped here. And this would seem very strange for a rice growing population to not go to the lands which were the easiest to till. And they also view Korku as an outlier. And so this would be then their interpretation a group 
which left the main area and moved farther to the west. Now, as much as I, I, I have no, I cannot say if it's true they came from the east. Um, the most likely area would be here, the Irrawaddy Delta, or perhaps the Isthmus of Kra. Uh, but be that as it may, I do like the idea, but there are some problems with it. For example, we know Gospel uh, from 19, 1873 writes that the Santas, that would be this group up here, uh, here in the east, especially northeast, they write that, or they claimed that they migrated from a western homeland, which they called Hihiri Papiri, to their present day homeland. Now, uh, they say that it was probably the Caspian Sea. I would be a little bit more modest here and say, well, the west means the west and not several thousand kilometers to the northwest, probably central India. If it's true, the Munda, the Mundari, sorry, also say something very similar. They refer to it, as far as I know, as Ahiri Kipiri. Now, this has nothing to do with Har Harappa or anything like that. You can see on the date, this is long before the ruins in Harappa have been excavated. So um, this cannot be connected with that. Now, I would say, if we go back to the map, and this is where the quote from this, and these people all say they come from the west. It was probably somewhere around here. That would be my best bet. Also, as I mentioned, why on earth would a right village wrong population come to perfect land to do agriculture and then just say, nah, we'll stay in the mountains? It doesn't really make sense. Now, there is another reason which forces me as a linguist to call that into question. And these, this is the notion of a spread zone or an accretion zone. This goes back to Nichols. In some ways it's common sense, but she was the one who first formalized it and said, let's talk about this in detail. We know that certain areas are more prone than others to rapid and total linguistic change. For example, the step of uh, the Eurasian step. Um, we have, it used to be um, inhabited by the Scythian, we call them in English, was Shaka. But then we have different peoples coming in, and after a short period, maybe a few hundred years, the languages that were once there are gone. And the new languages take over completely. They replace the other languages. This does not mean they killed the other people. It doesn't have to be that. It just means if, you have, if you're in a zone like this, languages spread easy, and the language of the new ruling class is learned by everyone. There's really no place to hide, if you want to put it that way. This is, of course, different if you look at the Himalaya. For example, in Nepal, as small it is, as it is, it probably has 130, 140 languages. Now, this is because they can survive with their language relatively isolated in, in, the, in the higher region. So if you look again now at, um, oh, I'm sorry, spread zones then would have a low genealogical density, that is, um, one family, probably. The language spreads quickly, and here you have classical dialect groups, at least in the beginning. Uh, for example, German and Dutch, as you, as you go from village to village, the language changes a bit, but if you look at the two ed edges, High German and, and, and Dutch, they're very different. But of course, it's a classic dialect. We have no long-term increase in diversity. Uh, one language replaces the other, and we have a lingua franca, or a language of general communication, where everyone uses this language to con converse with everyone else. And if we look at South Asia, from a purely geographical point of view, the first thing you notice, of course, is this, the, in English we refer to as the Indo-Gangetic Basin, uh, especially I'll concentrate on this area. This, if you, if you, if you except that Indo-Aryan speakers once entered the subcontinent from the Northwest, when they arrived here, the normal place, place for them to go would have been down the river and to the coast. This is a classic spread zone. This does not mean we know that there are other peoples living in the subcontinent when Indo-Aryan speakers arrived. If you look at the Vedic Bay, for example, it is full of different peoples about whom we know nothing now, except they will not have been Sanskrit speakers. They must have spoken something else. These people switched completely to Indo-Aryan, and the languages moved down the river. Of course, it's very easy to travel on a river, like the Yungas and the other rivers, of course, there's several others here. But 
they would have come also done trade and those who have who trade goods and have the network their languages will have a, a certain attract a, attractiveness to them for other speakers especially if there are other many other languages so everyone can use the same language to communicate with everyone else just as I'm doing now in English with speakers from everything from Hindi to Marathi to many 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 other languages now from there of course eventually they spread further up to the hills down the coast well, I'll show you a map of that later. And also into the hill regions, but down the west coast as well, especially first between the western half of the coast and then moving inland. Now, if we look at residual zones or accretion zones, they're the exact opposite. Low density, genealogical density, no real spread of languages. Um, the, the number of languages increases with time. It's referred to as vertical diversity. There are many terms for it. But the higher you go, the more languages you find. And there's no traditional lingua franca. Basically, you learn the language of your neighbors. You learn the languages that you need. Now, there's no one language like Hindi that everyone learns. If you are small groups living next to each other, each one, each group having its own profession and exchanging goods on an equal basis. So if you if you go back to our map. And we look at the other language families, of course, Dravidian is in the south, it's firmly established there. But let's look at Monda. It is, of course, spread further, but that's in the 19th century uh, with generally forced labor on the tea plantations uh, under British rule. But this is their traditional homeland. And if you look, it's all the hill regions. These are not especially high mountains, of course, but they are difficult to reach um, and uninteresting if you are interested in trade on a large scale or agriculture on a large scale. And these are where the languages survived. And if you recall the spread zone, if they were here, as I assume, and I'll, have, I'll mention them at the end as well, again, um, they would have switched at an early stage to Indo-Aryan because everyone else did and the ruling classes used Indo-Aryan languages. But the languages survived up until today, which is quite a feat, uh, they've survived until today. And if we look at the Kasiwa, the other branch in South Asia, it's also in the hills, as well as several smaller Dravidian languages, but also languages such as Kuru and Mariko, but also Brahui, far, far in the northwest. We also find Nihali, which, for example, uh, my colleague Shailene de Mohan has, uh, has worked on, also in an isolated, of course, nowadays nothing is isolated. Uh, we have good roads, we have planes, etc. But for people on foot, this would have been quite a journey to get from here, from the Doha, for example, to the, the hills of central India. Uh, that, this is why these languages survive. These are isolates, they're not related to any other language. If we look at other isolates in the subcontinent, we have Burushaki in the far north, again in the mountains, and also Kusunda which still has perhaps a few speakers, but also from a relatively inaccessible region. So here, this is exactly what we expect, which gives me the my, 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 my motivation to continue looking at, if we just assume as a complete outsider, what is likely to have happened, this shows us this is pretty much what we were expecting, and we should keep going down this path. So I would say we can forget um, the fact that there are no Buddha languages now spoken here. And the two authors, um, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, state that because there are no traces here of Buddha languages before British rule or before the, the Muslim invasion, we can assume that they were never here. I would say that is that would have been a good reason 2,000 years earlier, but. And at 1000 AD, this is probably not, over 1000 common era, this would not be a valid argument in my view. They were long gone, and I'm sure there were other languages as well, including Dravidian languages, but also Iceland. So, um, if we just look now at the Indo Aryan languages, this is something I've talked about before, some of you may have heard it. Uh, one thing I noticed working on the languages of this region, this is where Korea is spoken, and I started working on the language called Sabri or uh, Nagpuri. It's a little confusing, it has nothing to do with Nagpuri. Um, but it's spoken in this region, 
as it's a lingua franca, I decided to also work on that language, and I started noticing things which were very different, not only from Hindi, but also what I knew of Marathi at the time. For example, I call it the East-West Indio, Indo-Aryan divide. In the West, we have split or nativity. Um, if you, I'm sure you all know Hindi, so that would be, if you're not familiar with the term for nativity, if you look at the present tense, here's the present continuous, sorry, the present progressive, I forgot the word progressive here. He, then you know it's he because it's lik rahahe, and if it were a woman, it would be lik rahihe. So the verb agrees with the subject, which is in the nominative, what's called the nominative. But if I put that into the past tense, I don't say wo kitabika, I say wusne kitabiki. So the verb now agrees with the object, and we have here the ergative marker. So when I speak yeah. ergative, it's just like may in Hindi. And also very important, I have here wo, but I don't have wo me, I say us me, and I'll refer to this form as the oblique. Uh, we have it in many languages, before case markers huh? and postage. So, going back to our table, in the West we have split ergativity, huh? sometimes nominative, sometimes ergative. In the East, there are small pockets where we still have ergativity, but it's almost completely gone. In the West, we have gender systems uh, like masculine and feminine, or Marathi and Kokani, masculine and feminine and gender. But the thing is, it's not just gender, it's arbitrary gender. For example, in German, which also has masculine and feminine gender, uh, I'm a man, but it's masculine. I'm made a a woman, so she's feminine, but the door is also feminine, and my desk is masculine. Yeah? And a girl is neuter, but also the window is neuter. So this is arbitrary. When you learn it now, you have to learn its gender. Okay. You don't have that. You have either no gender system huh? or you have a natural system. For example, in Sabri, uh -huh. you have feminine for human females uh -huh. and then everything else. Men and uh -huh. things uh -huh. are put in the same category. Uh -huh. So you have feminine, uh -huh. non feminine. Other languages, for example, Telugu, if I recall correctly, you have a masculine system and non masculine. So men and boys uh -huh. and then everyone and everything else. Uh -huh. so, this is quite Welcome easy to learn, that will be important later on. Okay. This is a gender system, but you don't have to learn it with each word. You, if you know it's a human, then you know what, uh, what gender to use, and if not, you know what gender to use. Now in the West also, we have markers which have fused, become one with the word that they mark, so you can't, really, you can't always define where they, where they, where they meet. In the West, in the East, you all, you very often, almost always, have a marker which just adds on to what was already your word anyway. I'll show you examples of that in a minute. Also, in the East, all nouns have one stem only. And as I just showed you with wo and usne, uh, in the West, nouns have two stems. For example, you would say larka, larka gaya, but you would say larkene kangya. You wouldn't say larkane, you would say larkene. So you have two stems in the West, but you don't tend to have that in the East. And other things, I won't go through them all. Now, um, the reason, this was just how I started, this divides all inter area languages basically into two very clear groups, one East and one West. And the thing is, uh, there's no real explanation for it. Sorry if you hear that noise, but um, I, I didn't notice it until I sat down for this talk. My chair is very loud, so don't worry, it's not breaking. Um, so we have no real geological explanation for these two groups. If there were a mountain range going from north to south, we could understand it, a certain isolation between east and west, but we don't have that. We have mountains in the north, mountains in the south, and in the center, a plain. Yeah? So there's no reason to expect this difference, and in a spread zone, it's the last thing we would expect. So I first started um, this was just very, very small, a um, very small study I did on my own with 29 languages and 46 different structural features like is there ergativity, is there gender, is it natural gender or arbitrary, things like that. And I put them into an algorithm referred to as NeighborNet, which is from biology and it tells us what is more related to what because we never have clear sense with one group having all features and the other group having no features. Some features you find on both sides, but they tend to be on one side, or tend to be on the other side. 
So this tells us what our, our eyesight will not tell us right away. Is there enough of a pattern of similarity despite exceptions to still put them into groups? And what I found was these are the Munda languages, and structurally they're all very similar, including South Munda, that's the SM, and NM is North Munda. Yeah? So Korku is very similar structurally to Santali, despite the fact that they've been separated now probably for 2,000 years at least, but also South Munda in the same group. Now, if we extend that to Indo-Aryan, we find something very fascinating. We find Eastern Indo-Aryan and Western Indo-Aryan separated by Dravidian, but also Dravidian is separated. The Eastern Dravidian languages group with Munda, not with, for example, the Southern or the Western Dravidian languages. So you could, of course, say, well, uh, my has, I don't know, 20, 30 million speakers, and that's more than we have for all Munda languages put together. So we could probably at first think, well, the Munda languages have become like in the area through context. But that would never explain why we have an Indo-Aryan group which is separated by the other structurally, whereas it's moved in this direction. For me, as I'm working on language contact, this is clear. Something happened in the East where people switched from Munda and perhaps Dravidian to Indo-Aryan, and by doing so, they changed Indo-Aryan to the East forever which is why we find such a difference. And the same thing had happened within Dravidian, separating East Dravidian, or Northeast Dravidian, from the other language. Again, towards Munda. Now, here's just another algorithm. It comes to the same, um, same result, so I'll just skip over that right now. Uh, we had a project here. Uh, Ms. Calgale mentioned that, the one of my projects on the uh, history of, of Eastern Central South Asia and beyond. Here we have 214 features, so instead of 49, we went up to 214. We're now up to 229 for 40 different languages. I'll only show you now the results from our um, Indo-Aryan sample. Here you can see the, in, in the West we have red languages, and in the East we have green languages. Now, that is not just because of their geographical distribution. Rather, what that means is up here, for all of these languages, and here I'm just showing you the Indo-Aryan ones, we, we, for, for, the, for the entire Munda group, we use statistic methods, statistical methods to find an average value for all of the features you've seen for the Munda languages, which are quite, quite um, a, a close-knit group. And then we looked at each Indo-Aryan language um, individually with respect to these 200 and I think 14, I said 214 features. And the green languages here are those languages which are closest to Munda structurally. And as you can see, all of them are in the East. And the red languages are the ones that are structurally most different from Munda. And they are all in the West. Now, this is one set of variables. Um, we used another, but we come to the same conclusion. The only difference is that Bhojpuri here is a Western language, and Bhojpuri here is an Eastern language. Um, but still, that's just showing you Bhojpuri is one of those languages in between the two groups, where some features go this way and some features go that way, and which we expect. This is not an all or nothing. You have a gradual switch in the middle, and depending on what you look at, you might find some differences. But the same thing is very clear in both. You have an Eastern group and a Western group, and they are very, very clearly defined. Now, we can summarize that here. Um, two branches based on purely structural evidence. So this crisscrosses the traditional historical genealogical relationships. There's no clear boundary, but it's but still, we have feature bundles which are relatively clearly defined. Especially farther east you go, the farther the clearer it gets, the farther west the clearer. It's just in the middle where we expect it. It's, it's a transition from one group to the other. And in the east, and this is, this is critical, the Indo-Aryan languages in the east form a structural group with Munda whereas the Western Indo-Aryan languages are maximally different. 
Now, if you're working on language contact, this is no surprise. It's just something uh, I think everyone kind of always thought this, but no one had ever shown it. And so, if we look just at the Indo-Aryan, the border is more or less here. And on the east, we have a, one group, and in the west, we have another group. Now, why I'm showing you this rect boundary is because if we go back in time, this is a map um, of, the, of India at the time of the Maurya Empire, under Ashok. So, this is the third century BCE. And the boundary would be about here. And the one thing that you've probably noticed right away is that in the east, you have this. Um, they refer to it, this was from 1986, I think they would probably now refer to it differently, but it says here, unconquered tribes. Now, this is the area where still today we find Munda languages and small Dravidian languages. So, this east-west boundary, what I would say, has to be due to the fact that this part of India at that time was still predominantly settled by non-Indo-Aryan speakers who learned Indo-Aryan, especially here, I'll get to that in a second, and by doing so, changed Indo-Aryan to look more like the languages that they had always spoken before that. Now, why is this up here, it says Magadha, and it's very clearly Indo-Aryan, that's what it's referring to. Now, this uh, of course, refers to the fact that if you if you go down river, which I'm sure the Indo Aryan speakers did, at some time after arriving in India, they began uh, settling in cities or where towns already existed. The cities became much bigger, like Varanasi, I'm sure existed well before they came, but it grew in size and importance as new people arrived. Now, the fact that this was controlled by Indo-Aryan speakers does not mean that the entire population spoke Indo-Aryan. The ruling class certainly did, and with that, it was a prestige language which others emulated. They began speaking it at some point eventually with their children. It had enormous advantages. You could go up the social ladder. ladder. You could also do trade. The, the entire trade network would have been in middle Indo-Aryan or old Indo-Aryan. And uh, you could also perhaps take part in um, the larger economic life and political life. So it had many advantages, and with this one language you could speak with everyone, because everyone was using the same language. So this spread downstream, and once it hit the coast, it began moving down the coast. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story about Coast Kalinga and how it was conquered. Um, these, of course, do not these stories do not mean that the entire population switched languages. It just meant the ruling class did. And eventually, the, um, the citizens of these regions will have switched. But still, this was very much non-Indo-Aryan speaking. Now, one thing this does not tell us is, well, if we had tribes here, and we have obviously tribes here, why didn't this affect the language as much? And that's what comes to now. Uh, once we've accepted that there's an east-west divide, uh, we have to ask the next question, can we go farther than that? All we can say now is they're different. Can we say how they're different and what that means for history? And one possibility here is, is what's called sociolinguistic typology. Trud Gill is the, is, is the founder, we can say, of this, move, of this part of linguistics and has done most work on it. Summarizing it, we can say, um, in general, when a large percentage of speakers of a particular language, 50% or more, use this language on a daily basis but have learned it as adults, the language that they are learning is strongly simplified. Now, if you can just imagine, I mentioned um, Mongolian history earlier, so if you can just imagine being um, getting on a plane, going someplace, but it lands at Ulaanbaatar and you have to get out. Uh, and you don't speak any Mongolian. What do you do? You hear words, airport, car, whatever, you use that word, and you use it as subject or object. If you use the word in, then you just say car in, or whatever. You don't worry about things like case marking. You don't care if in requires the genitive or the dative. You don't even know if that exists in this language. You learn words and put them together. This is what adults do. 
we hear words and we analyze what we hear, and that's how we speak. This is quite different in the second situation. If we have long-term stable contact between two groups, and children learn the language to the extent that they become bilingual, we have a whole different situation. There, the language tends to become more complex. Children learn differently. They hear an entire word with case marking and a particular situation, and they memorize it. They don't really begin analyzing until years later. And we all know that experience of suddenly realizing what something we've been saying all of our lives actually means. Now, fixed expressions. There always comes a time where we go, ah. Now, children learn, but don't analyze. They learn the situation, the word, and they use it properly. Adults have a problem with that. So eventually, it becomes more complex because the children incorporate structures from one language into the other. They, they are at home with both languages. So, I thought I would take another look at the East-West Divide and look at the structures of the languages and ask if that might help us find out what had happened. And I took the two languages I know um, in, in any, with any degree of, uh, of intimacy, and that's Jharkandi Sadri. I've just published in Grammar uh, together with a colleague of mine from Ranchi, which hopefully will soon appear at uh, CIIL. And I've, been, I've used the pandemic to finally learn alchemy. Um, but I have published sources. I can't do field work, of course. So uh, alchemy is actually fascinating. Um, I wasn't expecting it. But I'll show you very briefly what these languages uh, look like from their, from their morphological structure and what that could tell. We begin now with Sabadi. This is basically where it's spoken. It's a lingua franca for speakers of many, many different tribes, Dravidian speaking, but also Munda, North Munda and South Munda. Now, if we look at some of its structures, we find it has two genders, feminine and non-feminine. They're natural. As adults, we don't have time to learn inherent gender, like uh, in German, the desk is masculine, but the door is feminine. We don't do that. We just learn the word and then keep going. This is gender, but it's a gender that we adults can, can deal with. You know? We hear it, and if the one we use one form, it's not the other form. So if I would say something, for example, using Hindi words, I would say a chi larki, but a cha everything else. A cha larka, a cha, a cha darwaza, a cha pirki. You know? I know that's wrong in Hindi, but that is basically what we would do with a new language. We learn the one marked category, feminine, and then everything else is the other form. And that's exactly what we find there. We have only three cases, the unmarked nominative case, the genitive, there are other forms, but cut is always correct, and then for direct and indirect objects we use key, just, just like ko in Hindi. But this unlike Hindi ka, ke, ki never changes. We have no oblique case for nouns, so you would never say, if you said lar ka, you wouldn't say lar ke me, you would say lar ka, uh, except that there is no ergativity here. There's no irregularity in the plural. In Hindi, it's not much of a problem. You can say larka, larke, and larki, larkiyam. That's pretty much it. There's not, there may be, I think there are 10 different uh, declensions, and they're very easy to learn. Yeah? But here we have none. You just add one, and it's absolutely, it's absolutely productive. There are no exceptions. And it's optional. So you can say, uh, ek larka, Duri larka, or you can say duri larka month. Yeah? So you don't ever need month. And even if we read out the verb to be, the copula, there are only two irregular verbs in Sabadi. One is chahi, like chahi in Hindi. It always has the same form. And the other is ja. In the past tense, for example, if I want to say he or she went, I say gelak. Yeah? So jai, he or she will go, but gelak, he or she went. That's it. Yeah? In some, for example, like Bangla, you have also the word to come is irregular, but that's typical for the East, very few irregular. So this basically um, gives us some idea of the differences between, for example, Hindi and Sabri. In Hindi, Pichla Mahina, last month, but Pichle Mahine Se, so you have the oblique here. Yeah? In Sabri, you would say Pichla Mahina and Pichla Mahina Se. You see, there's no oblique case. So this is much more simple. 
than Hindi in that respect, and Maya is far more simple than Marathi or Konkani. Also, the plural, there are no exceptions. Chawa, Chawa man, the Y, the Y man, Machai, Machai man, Hab, Hab man, Lord, Lord man, I, I man. I could go on for hours. You will never find an exception. If we look at Konkani, then we find basically it's like looking and holding a letter up in front of a mirror and seeing everything backwards. Um, it is the majority in, in the state of Goa, but as you can see here, it's spoken in quite a large region where uh, it's a minority language and most people speak a, Dr a Dravidian language. Above all, Kannada, but also uh, Tulu and a little bit of Malayalam. So. Here we find three arbitrary genders. This is just like Sanskrit. Masculine, feminine, and neuter, but it's completely arbitrary. And you have to just learn with each now whether it's masculine, feminine, or neuter. We have ten cases, not three, and partially different in singular and plural. In Sabin, it's always the same case one. All nouns have a bleak, have an oblique case and an oblique, obligatory plural, but the thing is you can never predict them really. And this is what I did during my pandemic year. I finally figured out the system and I've come up with 33 different inflectional classes and subclasses. Just to give you an idea, I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. But also, if you look at the irregular verbs, which adults have problems with when they're learning a new language, and I don't mean in classroom, I mean in, in daily life, even if we leave out the copula, we, we have 11 irregular verbs. Two in Sabadee, here we have 11. So this is the case system, and some of them, for example, the ergatives are different in singular and plural. Also, the locative, one of the locatives, we have three locative cases, two genitive cases, etc. So this is, the forms are not important now, just the fact that there are so many cases. And just to give you an idea of what it's like to try and figure out the noun system, those of you who are Marathi speakers will be familiar with it. It's, I think it's a little bit worse <laughs> or more difficult in company. Um, so you don't just have an archive, archive, you're done. You have, um, this is just class four. But as you can see, these are some of the subclasses. Um, here, if we look down here, Dave, God, Deva, so you would say Deva, Deva, saying they were, and the God's singular temple. But if it's the God in the plural, their temple, you would, you would not say Deva, you would say Deva, King Deva. So it's Deva, Dave, Deva, but the plural, Dev, Deva. So it's there are subtle differences between the different subclasses, but there are differences. This is just class four. Here's class nine in the feminine, some of the uh, many, many classes. Uh, class 10, so you can figure out if there are 10 classes, you can understand why there are 33 different classes and subclasses altogether. It's quite complex, and I can say safely, no adult, no, no large number of adults have ever attempted to learn Konkani at the same time. If they had, we would find the situation we find in the East, not this complex system. Here are the, the irregular verbs. I won't go through them all, but as you can see, there are quite a few. Jai we find, like Jai, and also this would be Ja, Ye. Here it's what, what, Re, and Ge, and then nine more. So this is more complex in every way. So, we have two groups to summarize, Eastern and Western. In the East, we have mass, we have signs of massive simplification. Uh, this suggests large number of, uh, numbers of adult speakers at one time learned these languages, perhaps somewhere along the Ganges, and this simplified version of Indo-Aryan continued East and South. Uh, so perhaps it only happened once, but it did happen where a large number of people at the same time as adults learned Indo-Aryan, in the West, we have, and with that I mean above all Marathi and Konkani, we have the exact opposite. We don't have any signs of simplification like that, uh, which suggests that we never had a large number of adult learners of these languages. And I believe that the modern distribution is also in, in line with this. For example, if we look at Eastern South Asia more closely, we still see to this day, and this is actually quite surprising, Several thousand years later, one of the languages everywhere, north and south, Dravidian languages everywhere, uh, and traces, I won't get into that now, of Iceland 
the vocabulary of some of these languages. Here, as we expect in the in the in the Doab region, the Ganges Basin, uh, sorry, yeah, the Ganges Basin, sorry, uh, we don't find anything except for Indo-Aryan, which we expect in this group. And there is work by David Reich and Magish Narasimhan working in genetics that, for example, the Tadu up here have a certain amount of Southeast Asian uh, DNA in them, which we find otherwise in the Munda speakers. And then to the north, the Ganga. Ganga. So for me, that suggests, and he, uh, I believe they're working now on things for people from this region, that will be very critical for this thesis, for this hypothesis, whether we still find DNA typical of Munda speakers in this region. We find it here, of course, but also here, which is very significant. If we look at the Southwest, on the other hand, it's an entirely different situation even nowadays. We find one group of Indo-Aryans meets one group of Dravidians. Here is another group, okay, this would be South Central, but it's basically one group of Indo-Aryan and one group of Dravidian, and we know that Dravidian was probably once much farther to the north, uh, based on place names and things like that. Um, this also is in line, by the way, with work done by um, um, uh, Professor Kolukani Joshi at your department, that we have evidence not of a whole group of people being forced to learn Indo-Aryan at one point, but probably long expanded periods, periods of bilingualism. I could show you, if we have time, if someone's interested, um, the, Konkani, the Konkani negative system is as complex as it is in Canada and typical, very, very, very untypical for indo aryan So the fact that Marathi and especially Konkani are so complex fits in with the fact that we probably had long-term bilingualism, as we still have here, by the way, where Konkani is now a minority language. So thank you very much, and I apologize for the time and for the mishap at the beginning. I'm glad that we could finally work it out. Thank you, sir. Uh, would you like to take some questions? Sure, certainly, if we have time. Because of yeah. the problems in the beginning, there may not be time. Do we have questions? Yeah. Uh, someone has raised it. hand. Nadir Ahmed Saab has raised hand. And I can see Uma Papu Swami also. So, Angi Kardile also. So, we will start. Yeah, please, please. Um, I don't know how to do this. Is there any word you prefer? Maybe you could tell them. Yeah. Uma, madam, your question? Hello. I don't know whether there was a... Okay, so Angi? No, I, I, I don't have a question. I didn't raise the hand. Yeah, there are some raising hands. Okay. Sarah, uh, let's... Yeah? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Um, so I have two questions. Um, um, well, what uh, was uh, the Kin uh, Ashoka language? Kin oh, Ashoka. Oh. And uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> yes. And another question is that uh, um, what do you think um, the, the, the Narendra University's disk, uh, disk language? What was the Narendra University's disk language? Uh, I'm afraid I can't get into those kinds of details. I'm not a historian. Um, all I can say is from a general perspective with, uh, in South Asia, we have in the region that is now, where we would now find Nalanda, that would be Bihar, of course, we probably had still at that time many tribal languages spoken, at least in difficult to reach areas. I'm sure Nalanda would have used Indo-Aryan as, uh, as, as, it, as its vehicle of teaching. What dialect that was probably a Magadan dialect, but which one, I, I, I cannot know. 
Um, but it was start, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was a new area. But I'm also sure that there were still many groups speaking other languages. We know of some, I can't think of the name right now, I'd have to check, um, but there are some smaller groups in Bihar which are said to have switched to Indo-Aryan within the past 200 years. So probably in, in, in hilly regions, but of course Bihar is switched earlier than, for example, Chattaka, which is more isolated that way. Thank you. So I have many questions that uh, uh, that can I uh, ready for your email at the right? Sure. It's, uh, can I send it here? Is there a way to send it to everyone? So you can type on uh, chat, and the same thing will appear. Yeah. Okay. There. Oh, there's chat. Okay. I always am happy to receive comments, and not just not just comments saying "wonderful job, sir." Of course, everyone likes those comments, but um, also if you have questions or if you disagree, um, this is something I'm not attached to. This um, this is not emotional for me. I know for some people it is. I've had that in, in, in lectures where people were very angered by what I was saying. Um, it's not personal for me, so I don't mind if you disagree. Uh, I just, as long as we can discuss it, it's, it's fine. I, I, I really enjoy those kinds of discussions. Uh, Especially it's now, it's terrible times, but we can stay in touch. Thank you so much. May I? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, John. It was very Hi. interesting to hear you out and a very, very different kind of uh, topic that you generally uh, are involved in. Am I audible? Yes, you are, yes. Okay, um, there are a couple of things. Uh, the first thing that uh, I I like the way you divided the indo aryan languages into East and West, which uh, structurally they are very different, has been known to us. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the latest genetic studies also indicate that people who migrated from Southeast Asia to the land, which is now known as Australasia, the Australasia, the languages, as it happens in every migration, it is only the men, mostly the men who migrate, and they come and marry the local woman, and the children then speak some kind of, uh, uh, maybe you can say Creole or a mixed language or, a, you know. Anyway, so we, it appears that the real Munda women were already here and the men from Southeast Asia came and gave the touch of the, you can say, an Austro-Asiatic favor. Because the absence of retro, you have not touched the retroflexion aspect. You see, the, the, the East Indo-Aryan languages, you say, are influenced by the Munda and Dravidian. And, uh, but then how do you, uh, how do you, how do you justify that there is an absence of retroflexion in Munda? despite the fact that it has been surrounded by both East-West Indo-Aryan languages and Dravidian, number one. I think, well, first of all, with the, with the founders, the so-called founders, I, I agree, I didn't, I, there are so many things I had to leave out. Um, at first I thought 50 minutes, wow, I can say everything, but of course you can't. <laughs> yes, um, yes. So that, that would also explain why the mother languages are structurally so different from Southeast Asian languages, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Retroflexion, I, I don't discuss these, I, I did not include phonological criteria in the database, but I think with Munda it's quite clear, we didn't originally have distinctive retroflexion, retroflexion in these languages. You have, for example, a retroflex B, but then you have a dental P. And I think most people would say, well, it's, you can't really say if it's a voice distinction or a, a, a point of articulation distinction, but there is a distinction between the and the. But there's no real, the farther back you go, the fewer distinctive words you can find where retroflexion or dental is the only distinction. So it seems safe to say that this was not found in Wanda originally as a distinctive feature, and that's perhaps why it's 
you do have heart reflection in, in eastern Indo areas. It's but, not Cantonese, except Dalsamese. Yes. But for example, in Saudi, you have the, the, but you don't have a na. Uh, so I think retroflexion in general in Eastern Indo area is much weaker than, for example, if you look if you look at Konkani, you not only have the, the, but you also have the and la. And, uh, oh, I, excuse me, I don't agree because the Bengali okay. and all its dialects have very strong retroflexion. Okay. As I said, we didn't include retroflexion in the database, and I'm speaking only from my, my perspective with uh, looking at Sabri and Korta and Kodimali, where you don't um, you don't have the na or la. But okay, then perhaps you not in that sense, but you do have it in the uh, frontal region. You see, I think uh, we can safely say a bar in Munda that retroflexion looks like a South Asian language DNA. Even the Andaman language, languages from the, the Andaman, also have it very, very strongly and phonemic distinction in Jarva, in Onge, in Greater Andamani. So it looks like a typical you know, South Asian DNA. So I do not know how, and can someone explain how and why the, the so-called Munda languages had been totally devoid of it? I, I, I would still say it's because they came from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you still find it, I, I, I can I can read simple Bangla, but I, I've never really worked on it. Mm -hmm. But if it's really, if you also have a na and also a la, I don't know. But um, the Magadan languages are very weak with respect to re retroflexation, and we even find some words where you can use a da, but you can also use a da in the same word. Mm -hmm. And I think probably from my city down all the way to the Sudani languages. You don't have a, a, a retroflex nasal. So maybe it's just this region. There's another feature which is, much, which is I think, worth uh, looking into very deeply is the ergativity, yes. which you did explain. But uh, you see, the, I think the ergativity, the traces of ergativity was there in the Vedic uh, speech also, because you do find a retroflex lateral in, uh, in Vedic Sanskrit. And uh, then, then comes the Munda area and you do have no retroflexes, you have no ergativity and all the entire Eastern Indo-Aryan languages are not, do not have ergativity. So the ergativity is another feature I think we have to look into very closely to define the linguistic, social linguistic typology. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I think with ergativity that disappeared probably at the first encounter where um, Indo-Aryan was learned by non-Indo-Aryan speakers, and the simplified version probably went further to me. But, but we do find it. Um, I was, we were very surprised well, in our project. We also did field work on Sabri, Korta, uh, Panspargania, and also uh, Kormali. And we found that Kormali and Korta also still have ergativity, some dialects, but in very specialized uh, situations, for example, a third person acting on a first person or a focused noun, things like that. So you find it also in Bajika a little bit, and uh, so it's, it's apparently something that was there early but then disappeared with increasing language contact. But in these languages, I, my, I don't have my data here, but I find it collect, there's no object agreement in some of them. No. no. Yeah. Well, well. When, where you do have polypersonal marking with subject and object, yeah. we have that. We have that in Korta, We have that in Kordomali, uh, We have that in Magihi, Maithili, and of course Santali. So it mm -hmm. seems to be a regional feature, but then we find it again in Nepal and so. So that's it's it's really too bad that so few people work very intensively on these languages because there's still so much to discover. Yes. I don't want to take all your time, but uh, just a little uh, a suggestion before I leave is the very first map you call uh, the, the area which is described or illustrated on by the Andaman Islands, you still call it unclassified. Now we have a better knowledge. Oh. Oh. So don't call it unclassified anymore. We have a sixth language family, there's the, the great Indomanese. And then we have other isolates there, Jarvas and Munis. <laughs> that was not my map. 
That's how <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so modified map. We worked on this this very map and we modified it drastically. I'll send you yeah. the latest map. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That's from what you made. Very interesting lecture. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. And I put in a lot for early morning to get up, you know, to catch to catch with your lecture because I'm on the other side of the globe right yeah. like now. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I promise, normally when I when I present that map, I say the Hali is missing, uh, Ahom is also missing, but also, and then I always I always say there are two language families on the Andaman Islands, as Amita Abi has shown. I have the article and I read the article. No, I don't have to say that, but I yes, I do. I have to save the reputation here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, John. Just a couple of talk. Can I hear audible? It comes and goes, yes. Hunters and gatherers. 
That's why they're left alone. They have land that no one else wants, and the land is not really good for agriculture. Um, but you have also, in almost all Munda groups, at least for several centuries, they've been practicing some form of agriculture. It's actually the very, there are very few small groups like the Bien Hoard and one group that calls itself Korea, but it's actually, the, they don't speak Korea. Um, they, they perhaps never have. They, they do not have a sedentary lifestyle. They migrate. They perhaps are the only ones that we know of who are or were recently still hunter-gatherers, whereas most Munda peoples do, do practice some form of agriculture. So perhaps I, I, will, I accept what you say. I took that from the article, but apparently we had re linguistic reasons as well, and these are reasons I don't know. Um, this is something you really have to get, delve into. You can't just read an article and you're done. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of etymology, but those who are tell us that there are good reasons for, for assuming that rice cultivation and millet cultivation uh, goes back several thousand years, uh, at least in Southeast Asia, perhaps before India. I can only say that this is what I've read. I can't, I can't verify it or confirm it for myself. But if we assume that, then as they do in the article, that for me it makes sense to say, well, they must have gone into the delta, into the basin, the Ganga basin. Why on earth, if you're if you're an agriculturist, why do you look down the river and say, ah, no? Nah. <laughs> you, you would go there, of course, for the land. That's exactly the that's that's what you want. And then I would say they probably survived in the periphery as hunter gatherers, which we would expect. But of course, I mean, these are all the false interpretations. That means they can, of course, be overwritten if we have reason to assume that they were overwritten. So everything I'm presenting here is just a default interpretation. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm going a bit too far sometimes, but um, you have to start someplace. And for me, this is the distribution of the languages and also their morphological structure. So. I assume these things, but I will admit, if you can find proof, then I will admit that, that, it, that it's not, that's not what, what happened. Yeah. But I would be very surprised to find people migrate from Southeast Asia to South Asia and then pick, of all the places in the world, the Rocky Mountains to, to spread out. Why not go into the Fertile Plains or along the coast? I mean, I, I find it difficult to believe that they, as soon as they got there, they went up into the mountains where they couldn't do anything except hunt and, hunt and gather. Uh, but I don't know. It's so helpful, Kathy. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, John, thank you very much for your talk. Nice uh, to meet you, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Yeah, a very quick uh, uh, observation. This is, in fact, in continuation of the discussion you had earlier with Professor Abhi about uh, sociolinguistic typology and the contribution of smaller languages. I just wanted to say that a clear east-west divide uh, worries me a little bit, uh, and dialectal data from Kokni and Marathi might have something interesting to tell us here. Uh, for instance, dialects of both languages with a complete absence of ergativity well, uh, an interesting discovery we made, uh, a variety which uh, shows uh, subject agreement in an ergative clause only in the third person. So such uh, quote-unquote quaint uh, features can be found among the dialects of Marathi and uh, Kokari. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I will admit Kokari was a challenge. Uh, there are no really, uh, there are no courses basically on Kogany that, that are that are good for self-teaching. And there are a few grammars, for example, Matthew uh, Almeida's grammar, uh, which is excellent, but it's of course very, very short, and it's on the Christian dialect in Karnataka. Um, so I chose the Kogany standard, hin standard low and Kon Hindu Kogany uh, variety, because there's so much written on it, but uh, yes, it's, it's a meta language, of course, with so many what's called dialects, but I know speakers who tell me quite openly, I don't understand 
what they speak in southern Karnataka. I just can't understand it. So obviously there are, there are many, many differences. And um, I read that, I think, also in some of your work on the different dialects of, of Marathi. And I think these are things we definitely, definitely have to take a closer look at. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Marathi? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Hello, John. Thank you oh, for sir. a Namaskar. 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 Johar, Johar. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. It was very enjoyable. I joined a bit late, but I don't think I missed it because you had some problems with your internet connection or something. So, okay, anyway. Coming back, would you like to say something about the honorificity agreement in Maithili, Magahi, Kurmadi, and some other languages? The kind of honorificity agreement, how it has emerged, and if you don't find it in Hindi, and the honorificity as a Udhanan thing for what they demonstrate you know, a long time ago, in 1979 or 18. Uh, you know, the kind of agreement that there is, it is there. In so many cases, you know, the subject, direct object, even with adverbial phrase, phrases, with participants, etc., etc. And a participant who is not there in the conversation, three, three types of agreement. Well, um, I think personally, I can't speak very much here because I have not worked on these languages with polypersonal marking, whereas my colleague, uh, Nathan Paltial, has. He did the field, I did field work on Sabri and then was in charge of the project, and he worked on Formali and Korta. And what we found, I think, I, this much I can say, that it, it is very much an aerial phenomenon, and the double marking in some languages, but not in all. I think in Kordmali, I, I can't remember exactly. It's either Kordata or Kordmali, I'm not sure which, where you can't use it that way for honorificity. Um, and whereas in the other, you can. In one language, it's only for direct and indirect objects. In the other language, it's for direct objects, but also indirect or yes. possession or honorificity. Um, it seems to be a late development. I can't go any farther than this because uh, what we did was a, a typological project and my colleague is working, Nedra, I, I don't know if you know him, if you've met him, Nedra, but he's not him. Yeah. Yes. He's, uh, he's writing grammars of these two languages. I think one is done now in circulation for comments and the other is being completed. Uh, if you if you would like, I can send you his email address, and he can tell you this. But yeah, I, my I impression, know. yes, my impression was that it's very recent. Uh, this use this usage of the um, of the, one of the two markers on the verb for someone you're talking to, even if this person's not involved in the action. Uh, so I saw I saw him you something like that to to say yes, I'm speaking to you, but I saw him. Um, that seems to be quite recent. You might have seen uh, Mahato's work on Kurmari. Sorry? Mahato, Mahato's work on Kurmari. From, it's a dissertation from uh -huh. uh, Central East of English. I have, have but I'm sure I have. Yes. You might like to see that. And of course... Uh, 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 Is it written in Hindi or English? I'm English, sure. English. English. It's submitted to oh. JFL in 19... Okay. Uh, in the 80s, sometime I forget. Okay. M A H T O. Okay. Because he's found quite a bit on Korta, for example. Um, um, there's quite a bit written in Korta and a few things in Hindi, but I'll, I'll ask him. Maybe he's heard of it. May I, I make a comment here? Uh, may I make a comment here, Sharon? Yes. Uh, Subara, there was a very good PhD thesis done under Rajesh Kumar when he was in IIT Patna on honorifics of in Mathili and Magahi, especially Magahi. I'm forgetting the name of the candidate, but she described in very great detail how the uh, absent uh, participant is included in the agreement phenomena of verbs. So maybe you if you can contact Rajesh, you'll get some more yeah. information. Yeah, 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 yeah. From that, that I don't think we know. The answer for. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amita. Very good to see you, Amita. Thank you. Good to see After you. After such a long time. 
from a different yeah. country. Virtually, yes. <laughs> Virtually, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, she, John, she is the cleverest. Anita is the cleverest, you know that? Yes, of course, everyone knows that. <laughs> we agree. You know why? Before the lockdown, on 1st of, I think, May, you left the country so that she is not stuck by the ban on aid travel and all those things. She is always smart, much ahead of everybody. <laughs> So I'm not that? smart, my children are. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was due to come tomorrow, 29th. Oh, I, see. I had already bought the tickets to come on 29th. Okay. But they didn't wait till then because we had, well, this is not the forum, but we had a couple of uh, deaths in the, among the friends group and the family. So they were very scared. Mommy and Papa are all alone. How would they do? So they managed to uplift, almost airlift us. On the very wide, very last flight. <laughs> not only did you get one month bonus, but you also got good environment there. You know, here we are. Oh yes, beautiful, beautiful. Very it's beautiful. Corona okay. okay. Anyway. Yes, sir. Sir, I'm sorry for this personal talk, but uh, okay. it's good to catch up with people like this. Yeah, these are terrible yes. times we're living through. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 You raise the hand. Okay, no. Yeah, hi. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, uh, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, I was actually present for the uh, presentation by uh, uh, Sibyl and uh, Rao in the Munda Maritime Hypothesis. So it's interesting to see the other side of it, uh, you know, in your talk. I had a small clarification about the uh, social linguistic psychology that you mentioned. You're saying that when a large percentage of speakers of a particular language or adult learners, the target language is often simplified. I am not clear about the situation where this might happen. As in, what about the children? Like, there will be children also who are learning the language simultaneously and who would be picking up it, picking it up much better than the adults, right? So, how, how does that work? It's different from one language to the next. For example, um, if only the adults learn the language, because they're using it for trade, to go shop, to, to go shopping, sorry, that's a very modern expression, to go buy things, to trade things, um, then the children will have no, have no need for it. Um, sooner or later, of course, though, if the language does become the native language, then the children will learn it, and that's, that is probably very similar to creolization, where the language expands and solidifies, etc. But the thing is, at one point, you have only or mainly adults learning the language, and they leave a very strong stamp on the language. You have, for example, with English, um, English was very Germanic when it came to England, or went to England. It had three genders, it had four cases, and there were a few points in history where it was learned by many speakers of Welsh at the same time. They were forced to learn English, and they were the majority, but the people in charge spoke a Germanic language. And every time that happened, English became yeah. strongly simplified. It lost gender completely. The only gender we have in English now is he and she. For humans. Right. Some animals, but that's it. And all the cases were lost. And these things happened when especially large numbers of people, Welsh speakers, at the same time learned English. Um, yes, the children eventually do learn it, and things stabilize. Um, but it depends, especially in the beginning, how long it takes before children start learning the language. You can have a situation where only, the, only adult men speak the other language, uh, because women, if they stay at home, and the children, or it could be the other way around, the women go to the market, so they learn the language, but not the children or the men. So there are many different, many different situations that you can imagine. But yeah, definitely, sooner or later, the children do learn it, think stable ones. Right, yeah. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uma, ma'am? I don't know. I've messaged the uh, Uma, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. From CIL. Hi, John. Bye. So nice to finally meet you as well. This is wonderful meeting everyone. Oh, I'm so <laughs> nice to see you. Good night. So I, it's, it's one thing with an email, but it's another thing to see someone. Yes. <laughs> that is true. So that's why we, I mean, I never felt I didn't know you, but this is the first time I'm seeing you actually at least. Um, anyway, so number one, uh, 
a fantastic uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. I have a couple of questions. Uh, more, or I should say more like mouth thinking because you are uh, uh, talking about different uh, types of uh, teachers and uh, psychology, especially social linguistic psychology. I was uh, wondering what happens uh, to the time of your identifier. Uh, for instance, do the least indo aryan languages show similarity with Santali, Karya, etc. on one hand and also with some of the East Asian languages on the other hand? Because like uh, since you are going into the psychology, I also want to drag you into aerial linguistics, combining with social linguistics. That is one question. I have related questions with the same topic too. So should I ask the questions first and you can give me a consolidated answer? Well, I can answer that perhaps quite quickly. Um, yes? I'm very flattered that everyone thinks I know all these things. I don't. <laughs> um, I just, we just know in the project what we culled from grammars and put into our database. And I can tell you, yes, numeral classifiers uh, are found throughout Eastern India. Also, at least in the North Mundo languages, Malto and Kuruk both have them, as do Mundo languages, as do Indo Aryan languages. I can't tell you how far east it goes. It does change in Manglao, it's a little bit simpler, and I don't know what happens after that. I can't tell you, for example, if you have them also in the north part of the northeast, for example. I, I, don't, I just don't know. But in Jharkhand, Odisha, um, it, it loses, it, it kind of peters out to the north. Uh, I, I, I spoke, for example, with Professor Yadav um, from, from, from Nepal, who's a native speaker of Maiti, and he says basically we don't have them. I mean, they're very, very limited, but nothing like you find further to the south. So it seems to go to, to, to be very common, but they're not always the same. But where you find them, you find them across language, across language boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yes, so my next question is related to your answer. Since uh, we know that there is, uh, there are two, at least two patterns we observe with regard to the numeral classifiers. My question is, how about their occurrence? I'm talking only about the East Indian languages since your main focus is on that. How about their occurrence in the numeral plus noun construction? For example, if you want to look into the pattern, uh, they are optional in Santali Kariya, but they are mandatory in Assamese and Bengali, for example. I would like to know whether you've got any chance to look into this phenomenon. Do speakers drop the classifier? And if so, did you get a chance to collect more data on different varieties of the same language? To see when is this drop? And uh, is dropping more prominent in the major East Indo Aryan languages or what's happening there? Well, all I can say, I mean, first of all, uh, again, we only know what we found in the grammars, and I'm sure you know the grammars can be ex extremely excellent or very bad. So you, you take what you get. That's what I can say from, our, from my own experience and from field work in our project. In Korea, for example, but also generally in Munda, North Munda at least, uh, and in the indo aryan languages that we investigated in Jharkhand, you can drop them, but people don't. Um, it's very strange. I, 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 in my grammar of Sabri, which, which, which you have now, um, there are many, many words where we just don't find numeral words, where we don't find classifiers. And when you ask speakers, they say, oh, you can leave them, you can leave them. But they tend to be found. And in Korea, they tend to be found. But when I ask speakers, do you need them, they all said no. So it's, it's probably how it spreads. It's kind of fashionable or expected or whatever. But it's never wrong to leave it out, apparently. But I'm sure, again, I'm sure if we... I haven't done work, for example, on Malta and Guru, I, I personally have not asked them, can you say this as well. It may, we may end up finding languages where they're obligatory. I don't know. And, for example, also you find certain aerial features, for example, in Eastern Indo-Aryan, you can say, you can say, 
Motito the book that I was just talking about. When you change the subject, you can go back to an earlier subject and say Motito the book with a tone at the end. And you can't do that in any other language. So I think there, the pattern is yes, classifiers, but in every language and probably in different dialects, you will find very different usage. But I don't really know to what extent it's obligatory or not allowed. It's probably, yeah, we know so little about these languages. We, we were quite surprised to find what we found in Quartan and Kormali. We had no idea. Um, so we, we never expected to find ergativity in Chadkan, ever. But it's there. So um, I, if, for those of you who are listening and are wondering what can I do with linguistics when I'm done, Come to Jharkhand. We need you. We need you. Chhattisgarh, Odisha. We need you. Yeah. So I can't. I can't answer the question. Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you okay. for your uh, response. Uh, another small uh, thing which is bothering me is the word negation. May I say something before you proceed? May I say something before you proceed? Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I just remember, I just, uh, it is just reminded me that you see the, as far as the numeral classifiers are concerned, there is a theory that the Eastern Indo-Asian languages actually got it from uh, the Tibetan Roman languages. And I think MNO had suggested this as way back as 19, late 1950s and 60s. So you may look into that, those articles where he does describe that how this is a particular feature of Tibetan Roman languages. And even our work in JNU, you know, we have worked on a large number of Tibetan Roman languages and we find, found very complex uh, structures of the numeral classifiers, especially in Tani languages. So it's a, it's a feature of the Northeast and the Eastern languages now. Yeah, it's definitely not clear yeah. where they come from. Yeah. But I think everyone agrees they come from someplace else. And you find languages like Malto with, I think, 11 or 12 different classifiers, and then other languages with two. So, you find everything, basically. Uh, that is true, but of course this is a very interesting and complex uh, topic to discuss. Even in among Tibetan languages, we know that there are unique patterns. The Kutichin languages have noun classifiers, and the Borogoro languages have numeral classifiers. That explains when we talk about Boro Boro, it is more showing similarity with the eastern side. So it, again, it's Southeast Asia. That's the reason I was asking, or uh, perhaps thinking aloud and uh, asking uh, John whether one could combine aerial linguistic technology with the kind of data you have found and look more into the features. Because you may come, uh, you may come with a beautiful pattern. That's one thing. Another query is a very short one. You don't have to answer it, but that's something which was bothering me. This is again uh, another question related to typology, but negation. So it's another interesting phenomenon where Indo-Aryan languages have here differently, especially the East and the West. So since you're talking about East and Indo-Aryan languages, um, are they taking insights or showing similarity with Munda languages or the other way around? Uh, do you have any interesting findings? We're working on negation now, as a matter of fact, and we're, we're, we've gone up now, uh, we've added 15 new um, features to our database just on negation, and I think, I think it was Tej Bhatia who mentioned many, several years ago, I think it was his dissertation, there's no real clear pattern. We do find some aerial clusterings, but there's no it doesn't seem to cluster the same way as other features do. What we find, I think, uh, there's no one pattern, for example, even in, even in South Mokta. In Korea, you have two different markers. One is for, I call it modal negation, and the other is for everything else, indicative, but also everything else. And if you look at some South Mokta languages like Buto, you have two different markers, they're usually prefixes, but the TAM, the 10th aspect mode mood values, change. So one thing, if you, if you negate a verb in the present tense, what was the present tense marker is no longer used, but maybe the past tense to negate the present tense. And what was the present tense 
if you use it in negation, it means the future. So we find everything. Um, generally, in Munda, I think it's quite simple with with a with a I'll just call them particle, probably enclitic, at per proclitic. Uh, usually it precedes the verb. It can be followed by the subject marker. But generally it's quite simple. But in South Munda you find very, very different systems. So there's even yes. you can't really say in Munda we find this. In North Munda we find something quite simple. In South Munda we find simple and very complex, just a few miles apart. And Eastern Indo Aryan, I think you find also quite a bit. You find basically, like for in Nepali, you find either something preposed as a prefix or a proclitic, but also as a suffix within the verb. And you find things like Bangla, where it's at the end. And if you change the negative marker and use the present tense, it's a negative past. So you find all kinds of things. And then, of course, in the West, if you look at Konkani, then it's very, very complex. And you use infinite verbs. For the for the main verb, and then you use the copula and negate it, and it looks just like Kannada in many ways. It's the South Dravidian system, and it's so. I think I think negation is very very local, very local. Um, there are there is a cluster. My city, for example, is always the same. Just one marker is not, and it's the same everywhere. And you find a few languages from this region around the Ganga where you have very simple negation, maybe you have a second form, like in Hindi you have na, mahin, but then also mat, and maybe na. But that's it, just three forms maybe. Uh, and then you find systems like we told self Munda where everything is just, where you, as an outsider, you look at the language and say, how do you people understand each other? <laughs> Because all the markers change, everything changes. And negative plus present tense means didn't. And negative plus past tense means will not. So it's neg negation is very different. Yeah. Sir, we'll take the last question. Oh, oh, sir. We'll take the last question from Nikita Downker. Nikita? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, I am a opening speaker uh, and I would like to say something. Uh, sir, Kokni language is no more considered as a minority language since it is spoken by a majority people in the state of Goa. And also in 1987, it uh, became the state language of Goa and it is one of the 22 uh, scheduled languages included in the constitution of uh, India. So, yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, perhaps I was misunderstood. When I showed you the map, that's from Matthew Almeida's grammar. Goa has a different filling. Um, maybe I can show it quickly. I don't know. I'll try. Uh, one second. Okay, I can show you quickly here if, you, if, if I'm allowed to. Can you see that? Uh, no, sir. Oh, okay, one second, one second. <laughs> Yes, this is, these are the joys of, um, well, according to my, I'll try it again. Can you see it now? No, sir. I hope it comes up in one minute. Okay. Um, Obviously, something's not working here the way I would like it to. Can you see anything now? Yeah. Okay. I, now I don't see it, though. <laughs> okay, I'll just keep... Can you tell me what you see? Hello? Nothing. It's just presentation. That's all. Okay. That, okay. Well, then it's not working. Okay. Um, At any rate, Goa was, was, was filled in dark, and then you have dot to the north and south. And what I said was following Almeida, only in Goa is Konkani the majority language, and outside of Goa, it's spoken in all of those regions I showed, but as a minority language. So outside of Goa, it's a minority language, but in Goa, it's definitely the majority language. Um, that's what I said. I don't. I don't know if it, if that's how it came across. Though. 
Okay. I hope that's clear enough. Yes. yes. So you're a native speaker? Yes, sir. Ah, please write to me. I'm looking for some help with some things. Are you from Goa? Yes, sir. And may I ask, are you a Bangladeshi speaker, Sashti, um, or I I belong from the south of Goa, sir. So Sashti. Sashti, yeah. Ah, wonderful. I would, I would be very grateful if you could write to me, because now I was, I was supposed to be in Goa for the past six months working on company, but things have changed. So. Okay, you definitely If you ever have time, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now I propose a vote of thanks. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I thank Dr. John Peterson for his thought-provoking lecture. And I hope your lecture will drive us to think towards Indian prehistory through languages. I take this opportunity to thank our Vice Chancellor for his deep comments. I also thank our committee members and Subhangi Kardilip for their support to organize this event. And I thank Prof. Rafi, Prof. Arun Ghosh, Prof. Subhara, Prof. Umarani, Prof. Najib Dhar and other members for their gracious presence. We thank you for your being with us this afternoon. Thank you all. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.